downloaded it from, which was the Stellarium website. So it's a, it's a me problem. <laughs> I'll figure it out. <laughs> well, of course, there I'm using is. my home laptop, not my work laptop. So we'll see if my work stuff yeah. will be able to do it. The, there is a web browser version of Stellarium that you don't need the software for. Yeah, I've looked at that. I was hoping to use it for um, some video outreach for screen sharing. So mm -hmm. I wanted to get the software version working. But the web version is nice. Uh, Carissa, if, um, if you're comfortable working in terminal, um, there's a way to make your, basically uh, what I did, because I ran into the same issue, uh, I built and compiled my own version of Stellarium. So I did a web you search. would. Yeah, <laughs> but if you want, Just I can, like I can send can that, that info to you. Yeah, that'd be um, awesome. But yeah, that was I, I ran into the exact same issue, and that's the only way I could get around it was to um, yeah to build and compile my own because I think it's an issue with the with the installer. I think I read somewhere that um, the developers like it's open source, but they didn't pay for some license that like that uh, yeah. Apple looks at that says, oh yeah, we'll go ahead and open this. So yeah, also that'd be great. Older. Thank you. Older versions might install automatically because that's what we have on our uh, computers at work in mm -hmm. here. But I tried doing the latest version and I got that error message that Toshi's talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can go to the history and you can find older versions of the software. I mean, to be completely honest, I haven't really looked into it very much. <laughs> so I'm sure there is a solution. I just haven't found it yet. I just downloaded it and it didn't work. And then I had a million other things that I needed to do. And I was like, well, yep. we'll come back to this. We'll yeah. unpack this later. Well, thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, got, we're gonna start at 7.05 the way we've been doing as of late. Uh, but some fun changes that happened just today. Um, the biggest one being that the very newest Zoom client so if you install it at any point before today, keep it. Um, because everything <laughs> from today to when they fix it uh, actually breaks the program that we're using. Oh, great. Um, now, I because upgraded. it is, is, it, yeah, it is an extremely popular plugin and a lot of people who use it pay, they'll be fixing it in about two days. So yeah. by the time all of you kind of get your heads wrapped around what we're gonna be doing in the first place, um, then we'll be able to, to move on. So uh, just wanted to let everybody know if something doesn't work, Josh says too late. Um, <laughs> it, now there, there are ways to go back there. there you can um, find links on the Zoom site that allow you to go back to a slightly older version that works just fine. Okay. So uh, looking good there, making sure we've got everything. We've got our chat, we've got our participants, we're on, we're on YouTube. Um, so yeah, now you get to see a bunch of the, the cool stuff that we're going to do here. So, <laughs> that was cool. Whatever you did, Jackie. <laughs> All right. So, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. If you, um, if you had taken a look on the e-conference event page at some point this afternoon, um, there's a syllabus because I haven't taught classes in two years and I'm going, I'm going full craziness here. So uh, <laughs> like, I'm feeling like Robin right now. It's like, I need to be <laughs> teaching. I need to get in the classroom somewhere. Um, so if you go ahead on the event page, just a basic uh, uh, syllabus, kind of what we're gonna go over tonight. Um, we've got some time. We're probably not going to take the full hour and a half. We're going to just kind of get as much as we can out of the way. Um, and then for those of you who are able to stay up longer, this is kind of like grad school. You have a night class, there's a small break, then you go drinking. And that's kind of what we have tonight with the, the hospitality suite. So we are um, in the age of Zoom. Uh, last month, Zoom had announced they had 14 or 15 million uh, individual users. This month, that number is now 200 million. So uh, it, it has become the the conferencing tool of uh, the conferencing tool of choice here in the COVID age, and it it's it's fairly powerful. 
um, especially when you have a lot of people like we have uh, in the e-conferences or for, you know, um, companies that have had a, a larger, uh, you know, they have a larger staff. You know, if you've got 85 or 90 people on a call, Zoom works pretty well. Uh, but what we've also been able to see is that it is a powerful tool for interaction. And in this age of, um, of, uh, of, of virtual outreach as we, we we're working with, um, uh, with, with people you know, from our homes to their homes, trying to make these as interactive as possible is, uh, you know, it, it can be something of, a, of, a, a, of an issue. And so we'll look into some of that tonight. Uh, of course, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Mike McConville. I'm the founder of Dome Dialogues. I work at this company called Spitz, but that's not important for any of this. I'm trying to keep those two as far away as possible. And we can do all kinds of cool stuff, like put bugs in the corner, like right there, and pop up my name, and all kinds of little things we'll, we'll talk about. Um, but kind of how we, we've done this with the e-conferences before, it's, it's how we'll uh, work through things with, with questions today. Um, this isn't a one-way lecture, and we're not going to wait until the end for questions. So if you've got a question in the chat, if your hand goes up in the uh, participants window, uh, I'm going to stop. We're going to ask. We're going to answer the question because oftentimes the questions make most sense in the moment with context rather than 25 minutes later. So do feel free to digitally interrupt. And if we're going too fast, if there's something you want us to go over, we're going to take care of that. We want to make sure that everybody understands. Um, but tonight, what we're going to do is go a little bit over Zoom. Um, most of us have been using it quite a bit lately, so there's a familiarity with the uh, the layout. Uh, a little bit of OBS, which is the, the the program that really integrates with Zoom to make it as powerful <laughs> as it is. Uh, and then a few of the ways, both for Windows, which is very straightforward, and for our Mac users, which is a little bit less straightforward, but there's still a, a couple of ways for us to... Um, to make this work uh, with a minimum of, uh, uh, of money and time. And then we're gonna look through a couple of streaming programs uh, that you might be using and see how those interact with, uh, with OBS. So if you're familiar with Stellarium, we're gonna be talking a little bit about Stellarium tonight. Uh, if you've decided to go a little bit further down the rabbit hole and you wanna try something like open space, uh, we've got open space up tonight and showcase that. Uh, a few others, um, Starry Night, if you have Digistar on a laptop, that, that's we're able to do much uh, the same as what we would do tonight. Uh, but really what we'll focus on now is, is just sort of getting the, the sort of look and feel that we want out into the, uh, into the internet. And so uh, of course, we're gonna start here in Zoom. Uh, for most of you, you're in one of two views. Uh, you're either in speaker view, uh, in which the person talking is spotlighted. Uh, in this case, that would almost certainly be me. Or you're in gallery view, where you can see everyone at once, and that's all of the, the faces in front of you. Uh, as long as you can see my, my rectangle, um, that's where things are going to go up. If I need to spotlight or share a screen, then you'll see that. Um, Either way, it's up to you, however you'd like to, to, um, uh, to set it up. Uh, the speaker views are limited now to about 50 people. Um, so if you've got a smaller group or smaller interactive uh, session, you can probably have everybody on one page. It's easy to see who has their hands up or who's engaged. Uh, when we're looking at 70 or 80 or 90 people, uh, you should be aware, of course, that there are um, uh, ways to... to uh, move yourself to a second page. Uh, there are also ways for you in, um, in the speaker and, and views uh, to shut off the videos of people who are not video. Um, so instead of seeing somebody's name, they're just gonna be out and it's just those with cameras on, they're gonna be visible. Uh, the real thing at, at, at what makes Zoom powerful and the reason we're, we're able to use it today is because of its input output matrix, which is the very, very technical way of saying, there's a lot of ways to get stuff into Zoom and, a f and an equal number of ways to get stuff out of Zoom. 
Uh, so you've probably already made yourself familiar uh, with the bottom bar. So if you go to the bottom of the Zoom window, you'll see things like mute, stop video, start video, invite and participants and things like that. Um, the little up arrows, the up carrots next to the microphone and to the, uh, the camera are what are gonna give you your access to camera and sound selection. So usually when somebody has a number of audio outputs, so they have speakers and headphones and maybe a Bluetooth headset and they can't hear anything in the Zoom meeting, going into that little pop-up menu is gonna give you all of the possible outputs for that audio. So that's probably the best place to check if you're on a call, you're seeing people talking and you can't hear anything. Uh, if the problem is on your end, it's one of the places to start. Most of what we're going to do today does not concern audio. So we can leave everything as is. If you can hear me, I'm gonna be able to hear you. No problems there. With video, things become a little different. Zoom as a conferencing software is looking for cameras or uh, in you know, more proper terms, video capture devices. And in most cases, a computer will have one or two of those. Uh, it's usually an integrated webcam if you have a, a, a laptop, it's an external webcam if maybe you have a desktop. Those should pop up. You have a Logitech one, maybe it'll say Logitech. Mine says Logitech HD Pro Webcam C920. It's the one thing I've got there, so that's working properly. When we integrate in this uh, plugin, the OBS plugin, what you'll then see is something called OBS camera. And that's going to output from the software into the internals of the computer. And like some sort of black magic, pops up as a webcam. It's not a webcam, it's just a software output that Zoom can see and does everything else that way. So right now, I have my OBS running, we'll get to this in a little bit, um, but because it is a software that I can put the overlays on, it's one that I can change outputs and inputs on, all of that is just being sent into Zoom as one file, one stream. So Zoom doesn't have to do any work. It's gonna send it out just the same as if it was just simply your audio and your webcam. So this is one of the things where if you're worried about bandwidth, um, if you're in a situation where you wanna do a lot of this work, but you've gotta output it to a lot of people, Zoom doesn't care one way or the other what internally is happening. It's gonna see the same stream and output it in the same way. So by adding video or audio or streaming a program, you're not actually adding any bandwidth to the system. Uh, it's just looking at it as a webcam and, and that's what makes Zoom work so well uh, and so quietly in the background with OBS and with this, uh, this plugin for the webcam. Uh, when you want to stream out, uh, if you have a presentation like we have today where almost everyone is involved via Zoom itself, don't have to do anything else. It works really, really well. Uh, but in a pro account, um, for those of you who have either paid the roughly $15 a month, I think it is now, or if you have an education account that Zoom has upgraded. In some cases, I think they're, they're taking free education accounts and upgrading them to pro you have the ability to stream to certain websites. Uh, this means that right now we're outputting to YouTube. So on the YouTube page, as I talk, we see more and more information uh, showing up there. You can do the same thing to a Facebook page or a Facebook group. So if you prefer not to use YouTube because you have 4,000 followers on Facebook, going to Facebook Live, just as easy, you click, It'll connect to your account. I'm gonna put a little bit of information in there to connect Facebook to Zoom. And then it takes care of everything else in the background. Used to be you'd have these, these keys, you know, basically 30 or 40 characters that you'd have to type in and make sure that everything was perfect to the capitalization just to get them to communicate. Now, Zoom is working with Facebook and YouTube, uh, Twitch, if you're, um, 
uh, like a, a gaming um, streamer. Uh, but these very, very mature and easy to use platforms that allow you to take your 100 people here and transform it into essentially an unlimited number of people uh, out on the internet. So no, <laughs> no having to worry about uh, a limit of 100. You have a limit of you and 99 interactive people, directly interactive people, and then the tens of thousands that are all going to uh, uh, to tune into our really good astronomy content. So uh, really the, 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 the future there. Um, for those of you who have been working with Zoom uh, a little bit more than others, you're probably already aware of the virtual backgrounds. Uh, I have a green screen behind me uh, because once you have that, that very, very um, uh, consistent background, it's much easier for the system to figure out how to take an image and project it behind you. So if you were to go to the video icon there in the bottom left of your screen, click on the up arrow, and at the very bottom of the pop-up menu, underneath all those cameras, you should see choose a virtual background. Uh, and if you look around the room now, you'll see a couple of people that are clearly not in their homes, um, in which case, you know, you might be uh, on somewhere in space, or uh, the holodeck somewhere of something, you know, um, you know, or on the bridge, you know, where, where, where you might wanna be. Uh, for now, I'll be in Jurassic Park. If you're Jackie, um, she is ethereal and, and floating in the, the, the vapors of space there. Um, it's a great way to accentuate, uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, um, it's a nice opportunity to kind of give people, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, cut the tension a little bit. And sometimes when, you know, if you've got a serious talk and, you know, there's a, I don't know, there's a potato behind you, for example, um, the way Patty went through. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if you look at Patty's uh, background, it's the potato that's also a, a Kuiper belt object. Um, in these in these times, it's probably a good idea to be a little bit more uh, irreverent and, uh, and that. Uh, I'm looking here. Uh, Greg Mankari, Zoom sometimes requires you to have a green screen depending on how bad your webcam is. If you have a newer computer and a better webcam, you can actually do virtual backgrounds without a green screen very effectively. If you have an older computer, uh, maybe you have a Chromebook, something that doesn't have a ton of power, um, you really need to be up close or very distinct from your background. So if you're wearing black, you're in a dark room, you're just going to be a floating head anyway. So. Um, Jackie, you look like an album cover, I, I have to say. So, uh, well, Chris says, you guys are just all looking just so spacey today. Uh, Frank Kusiak, newer computer, but an eight-year-old webcam. Paige. Let me, let's go ahead and, and unmute Paige. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> um, when it asks if you have a green screen, you literally have to have something, a green something behind you. Yeah, because if not, it's going to take everything in that, that scene as being green or close to it. Okay. And then I'm looking here, uh, <laughs> headphones don't work well with it, uh, mainly because uh, if you don't have a green screen, the area here between your head and the headphone tends to stay the color of your background and it can look kind of dumb. Uh, you look like you got little bunny ears going on. Uh, so if you if you want to use something like small earbuds or uh, maybe headphones that, that don't jut out, uh, that'll give you a little bit of a better, better looking background as well. So that's the, the basics of Zoom, the kind of where we've been. Uh, we're gonna come back to the software a little bit later uh, simply because what we're going to do is, is utilize some of the lesser known aspects of Zoom. Uh, the big one, this is the one I'll tease, Zoom allows you to, to log in three different times from three different places on the same account, a computer, a tablet, and a phone. And if you start to think about how those interact with each other, you you'll see ways in which you can utilize you know, the technology that's sitting around you to really, really make these presentations better. 
All right, so that's uh, that's Zoom. So now we're going to go over to OBS, and uh, hopefully, this won't give us one of those, you know, infinity breaks that just go on forever and ever. Uh, but I'm going to share my screen and open us up to OBS. So we go. So let's do OBS. Let's hopefully this will work. Okay. No one is recoiling in fear. This is good. Um, so what you should see is a slightly delayed, could be a second or two, version of me in the middle of a screen uh, with uh, OBS up there at the top of the window. And then near the bottom, you'll see scenes, sources, transitions. There's an audio mixer. And we have some controls. Um, one of the most important parts of working in OBS is that we want to be able to set certain settings from the beginning. Uh, these are going to be set and forget sort of things. Uh, they're all going to be under the settings menu in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, if we click on settings and we should be able to have that. Can you see a, a window pop up? Yep. Okay, great, great. Uh, your main uh, concern is going to be under output. It's going to be uh, usually third down from the bottom. Kind of get an idea of, of, of what it's outputting. Most of this stuff now is, is something we can't uh, um, utilize just yet because I'm in the middle of, of uh, streaming here. Uh, but what you'd want to be able to look for is your output Everything should, if, if it populates and you see information in there, that's good. That's what we want. We want to make sure that there's, there's information available. Your bigger concern is in the video. And when you're in the video tab, so that's going to be number five on the list, you'll see that there are two resolutions, a base and an output. Your base resolution should almost always be set to 1920 by 1080. So the standard 1080p. That's going to give you a space that's 1920 by 1080 in pixel size. And if you bring in things like webcams or pictures, they'll size properly uh, to what for most people is a standard monitor size. Uh, you can get really advanced with this. Uh, OBS is fully capable of outputting up to 4K. If you've tried to stream 4K content, it's difficult. Trying to make 4K content, even more so. So right now, setting it to that 1080p is going to be best. We're able to scale that to a different resolution if necessary. In most cases, if you have good internet, um, anything, you know, as long as you don't have DSL or, or, or dial up, uh, which, you know, you might laugh and I think 30% of the country still only has access to DSL. Uh, and I'm gonna pop the, the, the chat here uh, just to make sure. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay, good, good. So uh, we, we have some of the, we have some nerds in the, the chat who are taking care of some of the things for me, so. Thank you guys. Um, keeping the, the resolution base and output to the, the same amount to that 1920 by 1080 is going to be great. Um, that's what you wanna check to make sure that OBS is going to output properly. Once you've checked that, press okay, get out of settings and everything else is pretty much gonna work the way that it's supposed to behind the scenes. So we've got this brand new program. It's um, it's open source and scary, and you know most of us have, don't, have not uh, had a lot of, of time working in OBS before. It's actually very very simple when we get down to its base components. Uh, there are really two things that we worry about when we're working in OBS when we're working in this program. Uh, the first is a scene, which is a selection of sources. And so you build up a number of sources in a scene that you can then come back to over and over and over again. 
Uh, one of the ways of looking at scenes is thinking of it as a favorite file. You're incorporating a few aspects into this favorite. And when you come back to it, everything is exactly in the same position uh, that it was before. So you'll see right now, I've got things like introduction slide, standard camera, standard camera with overlay. And if I go and click on them, you'll see that the sources uh, directly to the right of them will change as well. So now I've we'll see seen... we have we have a bug on the lower right, the little Dome Dialogues uh, uh, logo, my header that I've created, and then the Logitech camera that allows me to have the background. I can shut these off. Uh, if I wanted to, I can turn off my camera. You can't see me anymore. Uh, I can turn off headers and bugs. But this scene, once I've created it, I can come back to again and again. So if I just want a camera view with a little bug in the corner, I have a camera and I have a bug. So the 920 and then the lower right bug. But this is not how it's gonna come for you. You wanna create a scene from scratch, uh, which is what we're gonna do now. And so uh, I've got a few here that we're gonna be using tonight. If you wanna create a new scene, we're gonna go to the bottom of the scene column and press the plus sign for add. We're gonna enter a name for the scene. So this is going to be uh, uh, our class example. Um, just make it something easy that you can recognize. And now because we're in a blank scene, a blank favorite, there are no sources. It is a black screen. This could be useful if you wanted a black screen scene to be able to transition or you know put something up there. Uh, but in this case, I think I would like to add a, a webcam and a picture and an animated GIF. So you're not gonna have these on your computer. You could go and add anything you want. Um, there are a few limitations as to what sort of files you can utilize. Uh, but if you have any background in Photoshop or Photoshop Essentials or GIMP or Paint, you've probably dealt with a JPEG or a PNG, or a GIF before. Uh, so in my sources menu, you'll see you don't have any sources. Click the plus button below, or right click, whichever you want. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna click the add button. And do you see a drop down menu? No drop down menu, okay. We're gonna, we're gonna make that work a little bit easier by uh, I'm gonna stop the share for a second because we're gonna actually share part of the screen uh, in its entirety. So you can see my background and all the stuff that's hiding away. So we're gonna go with uh, advanced portion of screen, share. Okay, very good. Okay, so you should be seeing the OBS window and then kind of an illustration on the desktop. Um, so shout out to former Grand Rapids Planetarium Director, Emily Romy for the, the cool background. Um, so now you should be able to see when I click the plus button, a sources menu. So we will have a number of, uh, and I'm trying to keep the chat open there. Okay, okay. Download, the dropdown was there, but it cut off. All right, gotcha. Um, you'll see that we have a number of sources that, to, to go with. Um, I'll briefly kind of fill you in on the good important ones. Uh, display capture, captures a display, one of the displays you have on your system. Uh, an image will showcase an image. Uh, an image slideshow will create a slideshow for you. Um, a scene will allow you to reference a scene another scene in your current favorite. So it's scene on scene on scene, all the just scenes all the way down. Uh, but more importantly for us, we want the video capture device. So I'm gonna click on that. We'll see create new. But in this case, since I already have a webcam, I'm gonna click add existing, Logitech 920, or in this case, because most of you don't have anything existing, Let's create something new and call this example camera. 
Now I'm going to click OK. I'm going to get a little window that pops up. And the device list, Logitech, Droid Cam, integrated webcam, all of these things, you're going to go for the camera that, that you're most familiar with. So the one that, that you would have used in, um, in, uh, in Zoom. Uh, if I were to click integrated webcam, I would be able to use the webcam that's currently on my laptop and not the one that's sitting up on the top of my monitor. So we're going to click pro webcam. Going to make sure the defaults are good. Just make sure everything looks proper there. Let's jump to 1080. Okay. All right. And now I realized something very important. You can't see that when it's screen shared. So let's not worry about that for a second as it, the computer is now wondering why it can't see itself over and over and over again. Uh, resolution is whatever, uh, so that was from Noreen in the chat. Uh, the resolution you'll set for your camera is the maximum resolution that it has. Uh, it's either gonna be a, a 1920 by 1080 or it's going to be um, uh, the, um, uh, probably something like a 720, uh, 1280 by 720. Thanks, Frank. So let's actually make sure we've got everything running real quick. I'm going to go back to my standard camera. Everything's working there. So if I go to class example, I'm going to actually get rid of this one. I'm going to add that existing capture device, which is why we weren't seeing it. And so now I've added my camera. I'm back. It's filling up the whole screen. And as you'll notice, if you look around the edge, you're going to see a red rectangle with some squares attached to it. And we've all been using computers long enough to know that those squares are things you can hold on to. And that means I can change the size of the camera. So I can make it super tiny and stick it in the corner where nobody can see. Um, can do something arty and be very tiny in the middle of the field. Uh, but in this case, I would like to have a camera that's, I don't know, maybe a quarter of a screen, kind of put it over here to the right. So now we have a full half of, uh, of our screen for images. So I've got that in place. I don't want it to move. I don't want anything to happen to it. If you go down to your sources menu, you'll see an eyeball for on and off and a little lock. So if you click on the lock, you can't move that anymore. I can't grab it. I can't change the size. If you like something and you don't want to bother it, it's probably the best way to go. I'll go back down to my sources. This time I'm going to add an image. And uh, hmm, hmm. I might have to take this off the screen so nobody sees my, let's see what we got. All right. Google Drive. Let's, <laughs> you'll see what pops up. Um, only because there's, you know, you don't want to give everything away. So we've got, I'm going to do a picture of, hmm, let's see. You know, maybe you're a fan of, maybe you're a fan of aliens. Um, so there's a picture made for, uh, cats are always good, uh, from Carrie. Um, I don't know if I've got a cat picture outright. I do have a cat picture. Okay, so this means nothing at all. Like, just pay no attention that it's a cat in a Carolina Panthers helmet. Um, I did this for a buddy on Twitter, and I don't know why I still have it. But it's an image, and it's there, and I can resize it, and I can put it where I want. And because this is a layer, just like everything else that you might work with in a Photoshop or, or a similar program. Image two is above my webcam in the sources menu. So if I move the picture over, cat's gonna cover me up. If I go to the sources menu and move my camera up, say I click the up arrow, now I am, I'm over it. So you can remember something's not sitting right. If things are covering things they're not supposed to, Go on ahead and check your layers. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to keep Mr. Mr. Cat. The cat's name is Paisley, by the way. Um, he's a space cat. Uh, 
he's also a fan of the Carolina Panthers, I guess. Uh, and then we're going to add finally another image. I think we're going to have this one be the memes in Photoshop, the memes in Photoshop's folder that you guys should all see. Um, let's see. What's a good one. Oh, we can do, I want a GIF um, in this case. Uh, and of course, what could be better than Ian Malcolm uh, telling us that uh, there it is. And you can see, we now have a GIF in the middle of the field of view. So we got pictures and animated GIFs and my webcam all together. Now you wouldn't want to show this to a group that you're teaching about like Zodiac constellations. This is, well, maybe you would. Um, there it is. And the, the whole idea is here, if you want to create sort of image slides, if you want to incorporate your, um, your camera in ways that maybe screen sharing doesn't allow, this is a very powerful way to use those things uh, to incorporate all of it together. things like windows. So we're going to remove this. Uh, and we're going to stop the screen share. So that now what you're going to be, what you should see, just as is me right now. Uh, one of the things that we have, and I'm going to move the chat window away from it. There we go. Perfect. Uh, one of the things that we're able to do is to stream windows. Um, one of the sources that you have available to is window capture. Oh, looking here. Somebody can't hear. Okay. So about, can you guys hear me now? Everything sounded good. Perfect. Um, any software that you have that's in a window is capable of being connected uh, into OBS. And so uh, one of the things that you've seen probably from a number of people is the utilization of Stellarium. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Stellarium, uh, it's one of the premier uh, free open source astronomy softwares in the world. Uh, great for showcasing the night sky uh, and a very powerful tool for reaching our audiences. It's a mini planetarium uh, on your computer. And so what I've done is put my, my camera down there in the corner. Um, so camera's in the corner. Uh, we're seeing the uh, um, the the little Dome Dialogues uh, logo off in the left hand side, uh, and then you can see Stellarium itself. Uh, this isn't about Stellarium per se, uh, but there are a few things that you should keep in mind when you're working with Stellarium, uh, or really any of these uh, uh, planetarium uh, software programs. The first thing is that what you see on your monitor is not going to be what people see on their TVs or their phones or their tablets. Uh, and one of the first things that really falls away, um, oh, uh, real quick, I, I'm seeing a, a, a question here from, uh, from John. Can OBS capture window like Stellarium or do you need to use a capture card, uh, which would be an external piece of, uh, of, um, uh, of, so of uh, hardware? It's directly in the software. Uh, so making sure we don't have all kinds of different sounds going on. Um, so what we've got is, so somebody did mention there was an echo and now that the apartment is so completely quiet, I can hear it and it's haunting me. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see if we, if we uh, can't work through that. But the, uh, Mm -hmm. Good enough for us. Uh, so what we've got is a situation where you want to make your stars larger. Um, you want them to be visible to people uh, uh, is, a, uh, is, is probably the best thing we can do here. Um, so what we're going to do, I'm going ahead, uh, is if you're in Stellarium, if you're using this at home, uh, if you go to your um, sky and viewing options, 
uh, and you go under things like sky and SSO um, for your solar system objects, it'll allow you to change the scale of the stars. So there on the right hand side, you'll see absolute scale. As that increases, the star size will increase as well. So if you go really big, the stars will get super enormous. Um, you can change the relative scale to make them a little smaller relative to one another. Or if you want to go the opposite direction, we can just really bloat up those stars. So if you really want people to see Orion in all of its glory, you could probably do a little bit better than what we've got going on here. So um, just big enough so that people are able to see. Uh, a really, really useful um, uh, uh, keyboard shortcut for you is Control T. If you press Control T, it turns off all of the um, all of the menus. And so if you're doing everything just by keyboard and mouse, uh, and you don't need the menus to pop up, you're able to uh, you're able to, to turn those away. So that's Control T. And then you can just see that as we uh, fast forward time, everything streams out very, very nicely. If you want to select our stars and turn on constellations, individual ones in this case, it's uh, uh, Orion and uh, Eridanus, um, works very, very smoothly here. All you're doing, interacting with the program just the way you would in Zoom, except now you've got everything that you need there up on the screen. So that's a little bit of, of how uh, Stellarium works in OBS. It's a window. Uh, it'll see the window and output it directly uh, to, the, to the stream for you. Can you the, go over why this is better than just sharing your screen in Zoom and you have Stellarium up on your screen? As, as to why this would be better than a screen share? Uh, yeah. In some, for Stellarium, this is really a matter of if you'd like to add the extra stuff. If you want a, a logo for a planetarium or for the museum, um, if you want to uh, place uh, your camera in a very specific way, that's where it comes in handy. Where OBS really shines um, outside of screen sharing is with some very, very powerful programs. Um, Stellarium works great, uh, but it is not as resource intensive for your computer as something like OpenSpace. Uh, and so we're gonna change over to OpenSpace now for those of you who are not familiar with OpenSpace. It is uh, from the team, I think, that originally um, uh, brought you Uniview. Uh, so the, the, the PI here would be uh, Carter Emmert out of uh, American Museum of Natural History, the Hayden Planetarium. Uh, Tiffany, I'll make sure you get all of those uh, keyboard shortcuts uh, for Stellarium, kind of changing things around and doing the individual uh, constellations. We'll make sure all of those are done. Um, in this case, because OBS gives us the ability to turn off what's called cursor tracking. Um, one of the downfalls of using Stellarium or OpenSpace or any of these softwares is that when you interact with that screen, they see the mouse. And it's, you know, if you're going for something that's a, you know, a step above uh, when it comes to sort of production value and professionalism, uh, this is, a great way to control everything on the screen while no one's able to see you do it. So um, if uh, we can do a little bit of um, flying around while we, uh, while we talk here, <laughs> as we, we see the, the open space and Uniview teams beginning to, to hash it out in the chat, um, this, uh, this is a, um, uh, a, a specific build of, of open space um, that has a, a, a few a few aspects that I'm working uh, here in the uh, uh, on my computer. Um, thanks to Dan Tell from the Cal Academy of Sciences uh, for hooking this up with some some controls uh, for open space. Uh, that if you're interested in using open space as a uh, an outreach tool. You'd want to talk to him 
um, as one of really the 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 most well informed people on earth when it comes to uh, uh, utilizing uh, open space for uh, for these sorts of, of purposes. And so, when you don't have a an on screen interface, uh, we've turned almost all of the interface for open space off. There is a, an additional um, HTML file, there's a, a browser-based control that I can work that allows us to do things like focus on Mars. So if I wanna move away from Earth and fly myself towards the red planet, I can do so without having to bring up things like menus and, and uh, um, sort of break that suspension of disbelief for our, uh, our audiences. It's, again, a, it's a way for us to make it look a little bit better have it be a little bit more professional looking. And uh, I'm seeing Josh from Cal Academy says, it's because our presenters can't be trusted with more complex controls. Well, let's see how that is. Um, if you're really interested in open space, definitely check out what's going on in the chat right now. There are some really, really smart people who know a whole lot about open space that can get you, uh, uh, get you involved there. So um, a great way to get around the solar system but as we continue to talk, you can see as resource intensive as open space could be, um, we are in, in this case simulating the entire universe. It is streaming out to you quite well. So we'll go on ahead and uh, leave the solar system. i kind of give you an idea a little bit about what uh, open space is capable of doing. Um, really the big thing here, it's free. Um, a bit of a learning curve, but it is a free software. All of you can download it. All of you have access to it. Uh, and of course, if you wanna fly around uh, the Milky Way galaxy or the local group, you can do so. And if you want to impress your online guests with some uh, trippy trips through the, uh, the edges of the known universe, uh, you're more than capable of doing so. So really quite, quite amazing. Um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of galaxies. Um, you can see, of course, how the Milky Way itself and our placement in the Milky Way prevents us from seeing large swaths of the sky, uh, but also gives us a really unique opportunity to teach um, everything from here's what's up in the night sky to cosmology and uh, uh, the future of our universe. So really, it's in our best interest to not limit ourselves to what we think might work in these virtual settings. Uh, it's uh, sky's the limit, um, pun intended, I guess. Um, question from Amy Gallagher. Does all of this work better having a second monitor? Yes, I currently have four, uh, but that's, you know, your mileage may vary. Two monitors will make all of this much, much easier. Uh, gives you control and gives you the space to be able to put things out and, uh, and, and, and try out new things. Uh, and of course, one of the, while we're here, we're actually doing quite well on time. Um, one of the best open space uh, flights that you can do uh, is, uh, is uh, if you're, you know, I think we've got the right time for this, uh, fly it out here to the, the Western part of the US so across the Pacific, if you know your snow-capped mountains of the Cascades, uh, you're able to pick out from space the glaciers of Mount Rainier and to the south, the crater of Mount St. Helens. And so uh, if you wanna teach geology uh, or you wanna teach um, volcanology or seismology, uh, there are many, many opportunities, many software packages out there that will allow you to do so. And so we're gonna, just for the, the sake of fun, uh, we're gonna fly into the caldera here at Mount St. Helens. So you can see what we're, we're capable of doing now from our homes that just a few years ago, you know, most sites couldn't do this in their domes. So the, the ability to, to reach out to audiences with some really amazing content is, uh, is fantastic. So you can see here, we're right above the caldera. We look off in, in every direction. We can see the, uh, 
the, the different ranges of the Cascades. All of this live, all of this uh, um, being downloaded from the internet, so the, the height and the, uh, the, the geographic data, again, all available to you. And so uh, a great opportunity if you're looking for a, uh, sort of a, a flight through the universe, open space, pretty fantastic. Uh, so, Franks, what are your system specs and your current internet bandwidth? A um, lot of internet. I think it's right now about 500 uh, megabits, sort of uh, it's a Verizon Fios. Um, system specs would be a good production computer. Uh, what you want would be a, um, an independent graphics card and a, a lot of RAM. So sort of if you... If you know somebody who is a gamer, uh, a gamer or has built gaming computers before, they are certainly someone that could help get you in the right direction. Additionally, if you're looking for something else other than Open Space or Stellarium or Starry Night, if you're uh, uh, if you've used that, uh, this Worldwide Telescope, pretty much anything that can be produced in a window, we can uh, connect with OBS. So we're gonna step out of open space for the time being. Uh, and then there's one final thing you can do with OBS uh, that's quite powerful, and that's the ability to capture from other computers. Uh, though looking at the, uh, the, where we are right now in terms of the um, agenda, we're gonna leave that for a little bit later. You'll need external hardware, but you can connect things like laptops and Roku's and uh, Nintendo Switches and you can play those live for your audiences if for some reason that was something that you needed to do. I don't know where that would be uh, uh, <laughs> useful, uh, but you can certainly get an idea for, if you can input it into a computer, OBS is gonna be able to read it. Uh, but what we'll do now kind of, uh, as we're coming back to Zoom, we're gonna begin wrapping up this evening, is give you a little insight into uh, a Zoom capability that is oftentimes underutilized. And it's the ability to combine a computer with a tablet or a phone. And so what I'm going to go on ahead and do here is share, uh, we'll just share an image that I'll, I'll open up um, because of the annotations uh, uh, ability here in, um, in, in Zoom. So go ahead and open up a file for us to uh... okay so this is a absolutely gorgeous image for those of you who have seen this before um, this is the work uh, of an artist in um, it's this place called Buffalo New York <laughs> Uh, so uh, Jackie Bauman is um, one of our better planetarian artists. Uh, if you are a member of Glippa, then you have certainly seen her work uh, on the cover of the latest newsletter. Uh, it is her interpretation of the Apollo 13. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share that. Uh, so you should see it now. Uh, beautiful Apollo 13 uh, mission badge. Now we're not going to do anything to um, to uh, uh, undermine this, uh, but I am currently uh, logged into the same uh, name on my tablet that I am on my computer, and because my tablet has a touch interface, as all do, um, if you're in a share uh, situation like this, I am also able to annotate. Um, so what I'm able to do here now, if I wanted to um, wanted to show you with a rectangle where the sun is located. On my tablet, I'm going to trace out the rectangle. And when I let go, I have now telestrated on that, um, on the, uh, the image. Um, so this is a way, if you don't want to use a mouse to point things out, if you're in a... Uh, uh, a, a meeting situation where you have a lot of um, uh, people that are, 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 are looking at, say, the same image and you want to mark it up, I could say, uh, let's look, I'm going to pick an arrow and say, well, there's the earth and that's the moon. And then I'll, uh, I'll, I need my pen and I'll be like, 
thanks Jackie. And so now I've written that out. I'm using my tablet as an extension of the Zoom environment. So what I'm able to do is, is anything that I could do on a computer, now I can do on a tablet in a much more effective way. But it also means that I can uh, carry it around uh, if, if you're still being filmed and people can see you, as you can probably see me right now. Um, this allows you to get a little bit more interactive or if you allow annotations from others in the audience, they can annotate at the same time. That is extremely dangerous. Only do it with a group of people that you know and trust. Um, I know almost all of you in the room right now and I still don't trust all of you with annotations. So uh, <laughs> we're, we're probably going to keep it that way. Um, oh, for those of you who have not heard the term telestrator before, um, the telestrator is a, it's an actual product um, that allows you to draw on video. I was made famous by John Madden. Um, so he would, you know, Sunday football, he would telestrate on the screen to show you the X's and the O's. Uh, so yes, uh, television and illustration. So the portmanteau that, that Ryan is referring to is correct. Um, but still here on my tablet, I can clear. And so I'm gonna go back into my annotations. I'm gonna clear all of those. And now you can see, we have people who are beginning to annotate on their own. So you can annotate on a computer if you'd like, but if you've got your tablet, now you have access to your own situation. You can type in text, you can put the arrows, rectangles, ovals. Now you have the ability to connect to Zoom in a, in a, in a new way. And uh, let's go on ahead and admit John Elvert into the room. Uh, I'm gonna turn off screen sharing one last time. Oh, uh, Julie asks, how do you connect the tablet? You are only connecting the tablet by signing into your account. And so if you can sign into your account, uh, I'm gonna end screen sharing here so you can guys see me. Uh, if, you end, uh, if you enter your login information to the tablet and you enter into the meeting room, that's all it needs to connect. Uh, so if you look, if you go through you all- the professional membership to integrate devices? No, this, is, this will be for a standard and for the pros. Uh, so if you look, one of the, the people in the room is DD Tablet Control. And so that's me on the tablet being able to control things. Uh, and then the, uh, the last thing, uh, that we'll, we'll look at in, in Zoom specifically tonight are polls. So if you wanna be interactive with your audiences uh, and you have time beforehand to set up questions, the polling feature in Zoom is quite powerful. Uh, so I'm gonna open up the, uh, you're logged in from another device, your polling session is inactive. Well, thank you. I will get out of there for us. All right, so now it won't, so I will now leave that. Okay, good. Now, as I look here, I'm trying to figure. So the one part that we didn't. The one part we didn't do. So, hmm. How are we going to fix this? I'm going to make Mark Webb. This is dangerous. Mark Webb, you're going to be host for a second. So I've made you host so that I can leave the room and then come back in and everything will work properly. So what you'll see okay, is I'll I should probably meeting. unmute my microphone. Uh, for yeah. That. yeah. Mark Webb, you may know from the virtual hospitality suite. Um, <laughs> so, so you'll see me leave the, the, the room momentarily. Okay. Well, now that Michael is gone, um, I would have to say that telestrated is really a questionable word at best. Um, you know, maybe John Madden did it. Maybe it's a product. I, you know, I'm 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 a little uh, undecided about it. But can still uh, hear you. Can still hear. You. <laughs> <laughs> so so now that that I've decided to jump out of the room and jump back in. The polls now work. So what will happen is I'm going to launch a poll 
has two questions. Uh, the poll will stay open for about 30 seconds. Your job is to interact with it. Um, it is completely anonymous. So nobody's going to be taking down this information. Here we go. And so the question from Renee is the polling a Zoom function or something else? Uh, it is a part of Zoom. Wait, where is it? It says you're now viewing the questions. Uh, if not, try to go down to the bottom of the screen to where you have the, the microphone and the uh, video camera and click on polls and see if you have that. No, no. everybody's looking at me like- No, nope. no. Nope. I don't see an icon for polls. No polls. Mm, that's disappointing. So, well, maybe either we broke it or it's broken already. Um, relaunch polling. Now, do you see anything? Yes. Yes. Computers, how do they work? And so I can watch live as the, 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 uh, the polling answers come in. So it's really cool, it's updating right now. Um, so of course, do you like trivia? Yes or no? Are you staying sane? Yes, no. Or the preferred planetarian answer, what's that? <laughs> um, uh, so Noreen asks, how do you make a poll? If you are the host of a meeting, uh, you will have a polls button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It will take you to an external web page, and that web page will allow you to fill in your polling information. So you'll have uh, a question, as many answers as you like, and then you can either do a single or a multiple choice um, uh, uh, situation. So we've got roughly, you know, uh, after about a minute, we've got roughly 75% of the people who are going to vote voting, which is great. Um, so we're end polling now, and I can then share the results with you. So it's a great way to not have kids uh, look at what the popular answer is and then give that answer. So since it's blind, you have the ability to ensure that if you're giving an answer, that's probably the answer that the, that person actually believes. So uh, two thirds of you like trivia, some of you are sane, most of you are not, which you know, seems to be par for the course at this point. Um, uh, so the, the uh, as far as I'm aware, Ryan, polls are not a paid feature. You just simply need to be a host and to turn on that capability in your, your Zoom profile, um, which is usually through the browser and not through the, the Zoom client. Um, well, Michael, so, did you want to talk about co-hosts as well, how you can make co-hosts? Yes. If you are a host, um, this is especially the case if you are on a paid plan. Um, if I leave the room without making a co-host, everybody leaves. And then we have to start this thing all over again. But if I like have a lapse of judgment, I'm like, you know, would make a good co-host, Mark Webb. What I can do is go over to either his, um, his, his video in the gallery view uh, and in the upper right corner, you'll see uh, th there would be three little dots that I see as a host. If I click that, um, I can then make him a, uh, or actually, I can't make you a co-host anymore um, because you're already a co-host, which is great. So let me stop sharing the results. We don't need that anymore. So you saw who was good and, and, and what went on. Uh, and then what I'm able to do, Julie, I'm going to read at you, uh, is you can either add a co-host uh, or take away their hosting ability. So if you're a host in a Zoom meeting and you go to someone's uh, name in the participant list or to the top right corner of their video, a co-host has an ability to mute and unmute. More importantly, they have the ability to kick people out. Uh, and usually what happens in a Zoom room is if you kick someone out, you remove them from the room. Uh, the default is they are not allowed back in. They cannot access the room again. Um, if you just want to play that game and they come back in the room and you kick them out and then over and over again, you, you can do that technically. Um, but for the most case, 
it's a great thing where if you have a co-host where you're in a situation, um, say for those of you who saw Brian Kohler's talk yesterday at the e-conference, having a moderating co-host can kick people out who are being uh, mean or obscene or uh, you know, are trying to cause trouble. Once you've kicked them out, they're not allowed back in the room. They can't access it unless they have a different login. Uh, and usually what Zoom will do is, is check both login and IP address, which means that if they're trying to access from the same computer, Zoom will kick back and say no. Um, Toshi asks, is there one host and one co-host? Uh, no more than that. I've not tried more than that, but I believe we can in fact have a, um, a third host. We'll probably you, try you that. You can have multiple co-hosts. Um, but there's also there's also oh, a great. waiting there's also a waiting room feature as well. Mm -hmm. So if you if you want to have people wait in a waiting room and then you can approve them as they come in and a co-host can do that as well. Yeah, and and so for those of you who uh, tried to get into the room before we opened it, you were in a waiting room. I see the name pop up on the right side, and then I click admit. If it's somebody that I you know in almost all cases it's clearly a name that we we recognize. Um, there's not a, I don't think you are all leaking Zoom links out to the general public, uh, so I'm not terribly concerned. But if you're in a public setting, that's when things can get a little bit hairier uh, and you wanna have control over those sorts of things. So Michael, I'm, I'm gonna just jump in here because uh, I'm still listed as a co-host and I've noticed a couple of things. One, when you did the polling, I could see the poll results, but I could not poll questions. Mm -hmm. um, and also my uh, raise hand uh, thing went away when I was the host. Um, Correct, because so, there's there's no need for you to raise your hand. Right. So yeah, if yeah you you uh, you gain powers, but you also lose some capabilities uh, mm -hmm. in host mode. Yeah. So now because you're host, I can't add a co-host. You'd have to give me back my powers. Okay. Which he won't do because you know. <laughs> now that he has it, he's never going to give it away. Do you, Do you want me to make you host again? I, oh no no no! I, we're 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 pretty good at this point. Everything's uh, okay. working properly. We're 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 pretty much uh, near the end uh, of what we wanted to cover tonight. Just sort of the the very broad overview of Zoom's incredibly powerful on its own, and for the vast majority of us, it's more than what we need to be able to reach our communities and give them what we what we intend to. It's if we wanna take that step a little bit further or use a few more of the advanced features of Zoom and you start incorporating things like OBS, uh, then we're in a situation where, you know, we may do a little bit more, um, uh, you know, we may do another class like this in the future at a time that isn't 7 p.m. Um, we won't do a grad school class and we won't do an 8 a.m. class either uh, for sure. Uh, but at least if we want to go deeper into that, if there's anybody that's interested in it, just let me know, you know, now, later, email, hospitality suite, e-conference. Uh, but now we, of course, have um, time, probably take 10 or 15 minutes for the questions we'll go through. Uh, let's see. If you raise your hand on the participant side, we'll see that as well. Uh, Amy had a question about polls. Um, Amy Gallagher, going ahead with your question. I wasn't seeing it. Oh, okay. So uh, can you set up multiple polls ahead of time? The answer is yes. Um, you can set up a number of polls for a specific conference call uh, as far ahead in time as you schedule it. So if you wanna have 20 questions, you can do so. Um, for those of you who are kind of interested to see how this is going to work um, when it isn't just two stupid questions, um, next week, Anna Green has a new segment of absurdly long German words, and she is going to have a poll with the German word and four or five possible definitions, and you'll get to see how that poll works. She can set that up ahead of time because we already have the conference set, uh, and then you can do essentially an unlimited number of questions as long as you keep the polling open. Okay, uh, we're gonna go with Tiffany and Sean from the participant side, and then we'll jump back to the uh, the group chat. So Tiffany, go ahead. 
uh, yeah, do, is there a way, is there some sort of workaround to uh, enable you to stream Zoom both through YouTube and Facebook at the same time? I have not checked that yet. It's possible. Um, most of the time it is simply because the bandwidth for two, of course, is at least double of the bandwidth of one. And in most cases, that would not be the greatest decision. However, uh, given the fact that that's a, a known thing in, in, in media where they're sending it out to multiple sources, that is something I'm gonna look into and I will let you know. Uh, because if you can run to YouTube and Facebook Live concurrently, that makes this even more powerful. Uh, Sean, going ahead. Yeah, I asked a question earlier and I saw someone sort of piggybacked on it for something I was curious about would be um, taking OBS and I was curious if there was a way, uh, I've sort of been playing around with building a wrapper that has our logo and sort of a fly in from the stars. And then my thought is have that then have your content and then have an exit wrapper that has some credit type of information. I'm wondering if there's a good way to, to be able to use either OBS or Zoom or the combination of the two to record that. Or yes, OBS itself can record directly. Um, so you don't have to do any of this if you don't want to. You can do everything in OBS, no output to a webcam, no Facebook, no, no YouTube. You can record it and edit it and upload it anywhere you want. It's, if you wanna go that route, of course you have more time, you can do more effort, but all of the scenes, all of the favorites, all of the capture remains exactly the same. So in this case, instead of streaming to a webcam, it's recording the output and that's the only difference. Um, so if you're in OBS, there's a button that says begin recording and it will output at precisely that. Gotcha. And then to have to have those different scenes, you just set them and then set a time for them, or just you, you play can, them and then move you through. You can it. if you want to. Um, actually, there I'm going to share one more screen with you guys. Uh, there's a part of OBS that's called multi view, which is a little funky, uh, especially because there's going to be like nine of me. Uh, but it gives me the ability to choose eight scenes that I can jump back and forth between. So if I wanted my intro slide and my standard camera and my regular camera and my Stellarium camera, and then the one I didn't show, but one I, I'm, I'm kind of happy about, the integrated camera, which is this camera and this camera and the pillars of creation, if you want to do something kind of funky and fresh, um, you have the ability to change between those manually and you can go into OBS and set scripts that would allow you to say, I wanted this to move after 20 seconds. I want to transition after 40 to this scene in sort of a, a PowerPoint-esque way with a lot more power than what you would find in PowerPoint. Thank you. Absolutely. Stop sharing that screen. All right, Noreen, going ahead. So how would you just... Um... Say you just want to record something, but it's not stream. You don't want to stream it live. You want to record it, and then how would you then upload it to Facebook or YouTube? Uh, the the OBS software will record, I think, in four or five different um, formats, uh, like an MP4 or an MOV file. But all it will do is record the file, record the video for you, and then you'd go to YouTube and either upload that file directly. You can go to Facebook or Vimeo or any of these hosting sites, um, or you could upload it to something like a Dropbox and then give people a direct link to the movie file that it's outputting. Uh, but all it's producing is a standard video file that you can then utilize the same way you would use, you know, one you downloaded off the internet. So, so you wouldn't just, um, you wouldn't record yourself on Zoom, you would go on OBS, you're saying? If you'd like that, that additional capability. So again, you can, you can um, record on Zoom for sort of a basic capability. And if you wanna go a little bit further along, that's where OBS comes in handy. Um, and certainly not to put down Zoom in any way. It's, it's adding capabilities rather than, rather than uh, you know, putting one down or the other. 
So it's just pressing that there's a button at the bottom to the right of chat and you just press record and then that would just record like that? Correct, correct. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Right. Renee, and then we'll go to the chat. Um, yeah, just a basic question, but you're, I really liked how in OBS you can have like the little logo in the corner and your, and your name. Is that, um, do you have to make that in like Photoshop or in an image creation site and then you upload it to OBS? Correct. So what, what uh, in bringing up my um, noises, it's the cat. Um, uh, in bringing up the, uh, the, the header, um, that is a PNG file, it's a ping file. So anything that supports transparency will have transparency here. So you can see my hand behind there. Um, so if you have some sort of basic Photoshop knowledge, it would be a 1920 by 1080 picture and you place you know, your text in your boxes where you'd want. Um, the little DD in the corner is another transparent file that I can incorporate and size and place. Uh, but if you can create it in Photoshop, you can import it into OBS and it's, it, this is the free simpler version of maybe what After Effects uh, is in the Adobe suite. Um, a little less capable, but then again, you know, you can make movies, uh, you know, Hollywood movies in After Effects. With OBS, you can go in there and in a matter of a few minutes have, here's my name, here's the, the colors we like, and then use them over and over again. And it doesn't use a lot of resources. So great question, great question. Okay, so a lot of people throwing out numbers and letters like FFmpeg. Um, Mary said, oh no, hmm. Um, Paige, do you have to drop file size on recordings to make them postable? A few years ago, the answer was yes. I believe right now the YouTube limit is 15 gigabytes, which at this would be something like six or seven hours. So for the most part, um, we should be good on, on um, as long as you're not on a very slow internet connection, um, file sizes will be much less of an issue now than they've been in the past. Uh, Jeff Holt, going ahead. We'll unmute Jeff Holt, there we go. Sorry, I was trying to use the space bar. Um, so somebody had asked this earlier um, and I had the question too, so I thought I'd bring it up again. Um, so the buttons next to uh, raise hand, um, I haven't seen those in the settings. How do you add those? I believe I added those in, um, as at, not, not those specifically, uh, but I believe in the, the pro host plan, there was an ability for additional emotions or additional reactions. Uh, they will probably refer to them as nonverbal reactions. So yes, I agree with you. No, I don't. The go slower, go faster is really the one that, that you know, that's the dangerous. No, none of you want me to go faster. Like anything, I'm gonna bring it back a little bit. Um, I think I did see the nonverbal stuff. And then you'll see under more, there's a very powerful one of the coffee cup, which states that you need a break. Um, so th this is the most passive aggressive way of telling people that they need to like shut up and call it a day. Um, so thank you, Zoom, for allowing us to, to professionally be passive aggressive. Clap, clap, as everybody does. Thanks, Michael. Absolutely. Uh, Jim Bader asks, so what do you have to do to get OBS to show up as a video source in Zoom? It was one of the things uh, that we didn't go over today, but is part of the event page. There is a plugin called Virtual Cam that is an executable file that you download. It installs and will automatically take your OBS, your, your OBS program and allow it to be seen as a webcam by the rest of the, the uh, programs on your computer. So this isn't just Zoom, this is Skype and Google Hangouts and GoToMeeting and WebEx, anything that can pull different 
outputs and inputs can see this. It's just that seemingly everyone in the United States and the world is using Zoom right now. Um, so we kind of defaulted to that one. But if it can see a webcam, it can see OBS. So uh, even possible to do this on like Facebook Messenger. Ah, and then the big question. So this is the one, this is the one we'll waited, we waited until the end, which is a good thing. Uh, Ryan White asks, what about for Macs? There are two ways to do this. Um, if you head into the syllabus, um, I'm going to add a link to a YouTube video. And that's like nothing good ever starts that way. Um, there are programs available that allow Mac OS to communicate with Zoom the same way that OBS does on Windows. The problem is, is because of the way that the Macintosh, the Apple Macintosh, the Apple architecture works, you need to turn off a fairly important safeguard in the computer to get it to talk to each other. And that's not something I'm necessarily willing to give my stamp of approval on. Uh, but uh, OBS, th that was one of the things that Nareed said, OBS will work in Mac just fine. It's getting OBS to output to Zoom without having to buy something external. Uh, and so there will be, um, there'll be some, there'll be some assets that you can look at and you can make your own decision as to whether or not you'd like to do that to your computer. Uh, but it does work. It's just a workaround that like the genius bar would not be happy with. Um, something where if you know enough about your Mac to turn it off, you're probably in a good enough shape to utilize it. Um, so there is a workaround. Um, and we may see, especially now, um, necessity being the mother of invention, that developers may look at this and go, well, there's some money to be made with a $5 plugin that allows the Macs to do this without having to turn off a major security feature. So uh, I'll make sure that that's posted and, uh, and uh, give our, our Mac users uh, at least a fighting chance uh, to utilize OBS the way the Windows does. Uh, Mojave did break Siphon. Um, so if you're on the latest Mac OS, uh, there are even more things to, to worry about. Um, but that, that, this is of course getting a little bit more down in the weeds for those of you, uh, who don't have Macs, um, this will sound all completely foreign to you, uh, but it's something that, uh, they're definitely looking at in the, in the, uh, sourcing community to be able to fix something like this so that Macs have the same. All right. Any other questions? Okay, great. Well, it's half an hour into the hospitality suite. We're five minutes ahead of schedule. And that means four conferences in, we still haven't gone over time. So thank you all. Uh, you, you, you're you unmuted so you can do what you need to do. Uh, but um, thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. Uh, so of course, you'll see the, the live stream on YouTube if you want to come back to this. Uh, and if not, we'll see you in half an hour at the hospitality suite. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.